Ralph Ellis, welcome back to the program. Glad to be with you again, Russell. Ralph Ellis has been researching the Bible and Egyptian history for more than 30 years. He treads where others do not dare and presents alternative interpretations of once believed biblical and historical truths. Ralph Ellis is the author of several books, including Jesus, Last of the Pharaohs, Tempest and Exodus, and his latest, Jesus, King of Edessa. You can learn more about Ralph Ellis by visiting edfu-books.com. That's edfu-books.com. Uh, may I recommend ralphellis.com? Just an idea, Ralph. <laughs> yes, we started with Edfu Books, and I'm, I'm staying with Edfu Books. <laughs> Edfu is one of the uh, temples. Um, when I started the company, I was in Egypt, and I happened to be at the Edfu temple, so I just took that name because it's nice and short and brief and easy, so yeah, that became the name. But it kind of looks like F.U. books. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I never, th I never sort of thought it. <laughs> I thought that's what it meant this whole time. <laughs> you know, something that has been of personal interest to me is the Ark of the Covenant. I suppose, in no small part, to Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's written about in the Bible, and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church even claims to currently possess the Ark of the Covenant in Aksum. Yes. You say it's in Syria, or at least was. Before we get into that, give us a primer on what the Ark of the Covenant is. Well, uh, we know exactly what it is, because there is one in the Egyptian Museum, of course. If you go to the Egyptian Museum and you have a look at the Ark of Tutankhamun, that is the Ark of the Covenant. And it's identical in every fashion, so it's, it has the brass rings underneath and the wooden poles that go through the brass rings so you can carry it, etc. And they're extending poles as well, so you can move them in and out. So that is an Ark of the Covenant. The question then becomes, I mean, it's just a box, basically. But the question then becomes, what did it contain? The covenant is an alliance, uh, you know, a pledge. And the pledge they were talking about was the pledge between the Israelites and the Egyptians because it was created, obviously, at the Exodus. It was a pledge for them, effectively, to leave Egypt and go away on the Exodus. I've modified that somewhat because I say that the Israelites were the Hyksos, so they were Egyptians themselves, so they were the northern Egyptians as opposed to the Theban Egyptians in the south. And they had had a civil war, as is narrated by Manitho amongst others. And the Hyksos did indeed appear to leave Egypt. As a part of that negotiation, the expensive materials and gold and whatever were given so that they could create the tabernacle. And at the same time, the Ark of the Covenant was made. So it was the Ark of the Agreement between these people for the Israelites, the Hyksos Egyptians, to go on the Exodus. So it was a part of that agreement. So what did it take? Well, it obviously took various valuables that would have been important to these people. And one of the things it mentions later on, of course, is that the two sacred stones were placed in it. The sacred stones become a central element of Judaism and later Christianity. So the celebration of Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. But Yom Kippur, Kippur comes from the word meaning stone. And so you can easily translate Yom Kippur as being the Day of the Stone. So we have this tradition of there being sacred stones within Judaism and Christianity. So those stones, two of those stones, went into this Ark of the Covenant. That sort of gave the Ark of the Covenant maybe some otherworldly powers. Now, the history of this stone actually goes down through the ages. And later on, we have a whole series of sacred stones, which were thought to be of meteoric origin. So going back a little bit before the Israelite exodus, the Egyptians had a sacred stone as well, which was known as the Benben. And the Benben was based at Heliopolis, and it used to sit on top of a, an obelisk. Now the Benben again was thought to be meteoric, 
So it could well be the same stone that ended up in the Ark of the Covenant, or two pieces of it ended up in the Ark of the Covenant. And the interesting thing about these stones is they were said to be magnetic. If we had a strong, strongly magnetized meteoric stone put in the Ark of the Covenant, then it may well have some otherworldly type powers. You can imagine someone who's never seen magnetism before being totally mystified by what this stone would do. If you come into the Iron Age and you put an iron sword near to it, it would take the sword out of your hand. That would indeed be a sort of very strange otherworldly power. So that is a possibility. Just a highly magnetic box. A standard box with two magnetic stones in it. And of course, magnetism will pass through anything, even if the box had gold leaf on the outside or whatever. Magnetism can pass through things like gold leaf. So the whole of the box would become magnetic. Of course, we know that the Egyptians, although they weren't officially in the Iron Age, people like Tutankhamun did have iron daggers. It's thought because they were not officially in the Iron Age by that time, they had found some meteoric iron and they had made a dagger from meteoric iron. But anyway, they did have pieces of iron, and that's documented from the tomb of Tutankhamun. So that is a possibility of what this box contained, in addition to any valuables and documents and whatever. And of course, they would be just as interesting as, as the stones themselves. And the tabernacle was the mobile temple, of course. So wherever they went on the Exodus, then the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant would have gone with them, of course. Uh, one of the locations they went to, the place where they got the sacred stones, of course, was Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was not in the Sinai Desert, as we've said before. I think we've gone through this in one of our talks. It was actually the Great Pyramid. So one of the places that it went to was Giza and the Great Pyramid. And then it goes off to what they say is Jerusalem. It goes to Zion. Again, I have a slightly different take on that because I said Zion is actually Zoan, slight mispronunciation. So it wasn't Jerusalem, it was Tanis. But anyway, it went further north, it went into the Nile Delta, it perhaps went to Jerusalem, but I think it went to Tanis myself. But it went to the Temple of Jerusalem, the Temple of Zoan. And it would have been the centerpiece in the Temple, of course, all the way up to the Babylonian invasion. So we come to about the uh, 6th, 7th century BC, and the Babylonian invasion where Jerusalem is sacked, the Temple is sacked, the Temple is destroyed, and the people are scattered. And we have two different exoduses from this period. So this is the Babylonian exile. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar took a load of the Israelites off to Babylon. And that included the aristocracy and the priesthood. So they went to Babylon. So one of the strong possibilities is they ended up in Babylon. The second possibility is contained in the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was the mad priest, he relates the story that after the first sacking of Jerusalem, there was a rebellion. So they left a, the Babylonians left a governor in Jerusalem, and there was a rebellion, and the governor was killed, and, and various of the Babylonian army were killed. And because they knew the Babylonians would come back, then the people who remained in Jerusalem scattered. And where did they go to? Well, they went to Egypt initially, it says. They went to Egypt. They went to a place that I think is Yehudia. From the name, obviously, it sounds like a, a Jewish name. It is, it's called the City of the Jews. And that's just north of Heliopolis. So it's in the Nile Delta. Small place. Still there today. You can go to it. But they were chased out of there very shortly afterwards, as it relates in the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah went back. Well, we think he went back to Jerusalem. But the refugees refused to go with him 
They didn't believe in his God, which is interesting. He was obviously chastising them because they were possibly polytheists, but at the very least they were worshipping the Queen of Heaven. And so they weren't being good Jews. This is typical throughout the whole of Torah and Tanakh, that they're always worshipping other gods. And these refugees were worshipping the Queen of Heaven. And that's interesting, because if you translate that into Egyptian, it becomes the Queen of Sheba, because Sheba means star, it means heaven. So they were worshipping the Queen of Sheba, a deified Queen of Sheba. Where did they go to? Well, it seems likely, it seems pretty obvious to me that these refugees, when they were kicked out of Egypt, went to Sheba, or what we would now call Saba. So they went down to Yemen, where the city of Saba was first constructed, the city where they worshipped the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Heaven. So I think that is where they went to. And the Kebra Nagast says that some of these refugees, not quite the same refugees, but maybe the same refugees, the Kebra Nagast says that Menelik took the Ark of the Covenant down to Ethiopia, which sounds like a similar story. Menelik was the son of King Solomon, so they're saying that it actually disappeared at the time of Solomon, and it was taken by the son of Solomon, King Menelik, down to Ethiopia. I don't think that is quite so likely that the son of Solomon was able to steal it from the Temple of Jerusalem and take it away without anyone worrying about it. I think it's more likely that it disappeared when Jerusalem was destroyed, in which case you've got two options. It either went to Babylon or it went with these other refugees who ended up in Saba. We come back now to a different stone, and this is known as the Omphalos. Now, the Omphalos is a Greek stone. It was supposed to be at Delphi. And again, like the original Egyptian stone, the Benben, it was a sort of conical, small stone. So circular base and a cone shape. And it was known as the Omphalos, the um, navel of the universe. And we don't know what happened to that stone. There are two copies now. If you go to Delphi now, there are two copies of it. One is a small stone which is only your metric in Canada now, aren't you? So it's about 70 no, centimeters. No, 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 no. Canadians don't understand that. We're in inches and feet. <laughs> inches and feet. Okay, two foot across and, and two and a half foot high. That's the small on the phallus. The big one, they've got a really big complex one, which are copies, of course. It's not the original is a copy of what the omphalus looked like because it's covered in chains. And these chains are sort of made of, I don't know what you'd describe them really, they, they look, look like seashells or, or seed pods or something in a big long chain going round the stone looking like a net. Listeners can look it up on the net if you just dial in omphalus stone Delphi, you'll see images of it. But that's a big one. I mean, that's two or three times bigger than we think it actually was. But it gives you a good image of what it looks like, especially with this netting that goes around it. So in the first century BC, we end up with coins from Parthia with this stone on it. And it's quite obviously the same stone. It's a conical stone with netting, which sort of indicates that the stones, these sacred stones, ended up in Babylon. But later on, of course... We have the same stone on coins from Greece and from the Eastern Empire of Greece. So when Alexander the Great took over the whole of what became Parthia, we have very good images of the same stone on the coins of the Greek East. And then later when the Greeks sort of withdrew, we have these coins from what became Parthia from the Parthian regime with the same stone on it. And then later, much later, when we come to the second century AD, so about 300 years later or so, we have the same stone in Syria. And this became the central stone and the central worship of Emperor Elagabalus, who was a strange emperor that nobody seems to know about. Emperor of Rome, of course. He's the cross-dressing prostitute. 
Yeah, he's the very strange one. So he, he's, he's the emperor who tried to turn himself into a woman by cutting off his parts and things of this nature, which was part of the Nazarene church. It's the same as we know the Nazarene church, the church of Jesus did. They were also into this, what did they call him? The primeval Adam, who was supposed to be a hermaphrodite. And this is obviously what Elagabalus was trying to turn himself into, the primeval Adam, who looked like a hermaphrodite. I've got a sneaking suspicion that the primeval Adam is actually Pharaoh Akhenaten. And if you look at any of the statues of Akhenaten, you'll see that he's a gender-neutral hermaphrodite character as well. He has slight bust, he has very slim hips, he has, sorry, very slim waist, very large hips, and no genitals. So he, again, is this sort of gender-neutral sort of character. And I linked him with Adam anyway in one of my books. So I've got a sneaking suspicion that the primeval Adam was a memory of Akhenaten and his reign in Egypt. But anyway, this rather bizarre emperor worshipped the Elagabal, and the Elagabal is the same stone. It's the Omphalos. It's the same shape, it's conical, it just about fits in a small chariot pulled by six horses, and it's emblazoned with the phoenix, so it has the phoenix on the side of it, which links it with the Benben stone, because the Benben stone was linked to the phoenix as well, it was the phoenix. And the phoenix, of course, is linked to the sun and the cycles of the sun. And the Elagabal means the Ella Gabal. So Ella is the Hebrew name for God, which became the Greek Helios. So it's the sun god. And Gabal means a small mountain. So we've got the small mountain of the sun. And it is a small mountain, because obviously it's a small little sort of hill shape of the sun. So again, we can perhaps see what this Elagabal represented, because it appears to be the primeval mound. If you go back to really basic Egyptian theology, the universe was just chaos. But within that chaos, a small mound arrived which was known as the primeval mound. And it was the first mound of reason and matter within the great watery chaos. And it's quite obvious, and it was linked to the sun, because sometimes it was conceived to be an egg. The egg broke, and a sun came out of the egg. So it is the egg of the phoenix, isn't it? It's the phoenix egg. The phoenix egg is the primeval mound of Egyptian theology. So you can see how far back we're going here to find the roots of this sacred stone. So the sacred stone, the yellow Gabal, was the egg of the phoenix. And it was taken to Rome because Elagabalus was the emperor of Rome. And he took it to Rome and installed it as being the centerpiece of Roman theology. And apparently the Romans were not very impressed <laughs> with this this change in their theology, they didn't appreciate it at all. The stones were in the Ark, they're not now. Where is the Ark itself at this time? Ah, stones were in the Ark, but I get the impression they were separated at some point. But it was in Edessa. Now this is interesting. So if we go back to our root of where it's been, it was in Parthia, Persia, and then ended up in Syria. And that's between sort of the first century... B.C. and the 2nd century A.D. Now, in between those, literally, both geographically and chronologically as well, it ended up in Edessa, which is in northern Syria, which is the town that I say that Jesus came from. Now, slightly after the era of Jesus, so we're talking about 2nd century here, there is a text from the necropolis of Edessa, the necropolis is actually very interesting. The necropolis has a Silbury Hill. So they have a copy of Silbury Hill at the center of their necropolis. And it's man-made, apparently. 
So you have this big hill, and around it you get these circular temples, which look like a sort of fat coin parked on top of a hill. These were the tombs of the Edessan kings. On the top of the big hill, the Silbury Hill, at Sogmatar, which is just near Edessa, there is an inscription that says the Ark of the Covenant was on top of this hill. Under whose translation? Ah, well, yes. You have to look at the translations that I've given. I've given two translations which both describe this artifact that is on this hill. However, we don't need to just look at the translation because we have a coin of it, several coins. And the coins have a standard Greco-Roman temple with a square box inside it with little legs on the bottom. And the square box is it's known as the Elagabal, basically. So now we have a square Elagabal, sacred stone, a cubic stone. The historians all mention this strange square cubic sacred stone. But they're mistaken, of course, because it's not a sacred stone, of course, is it? It's the box that they go in. It's the Ark of the Covenant. That's why it's square. That's why it's got little feet on the bottom of it. And we have this tablet which mentions the keeper of the Ark of the Covenant. And the keeper of the Ark was known as the Buddha, which was an interesting name, I thought. What is the bigger treasure? The Ark or the stone? It's got to be the stone, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the Ark was created to contain these sacred stones. And the Ark itself is just a, a transportation device. I mean, it might have been made of very precious wooden materials, like some of the Arks. One of the Arks of Tutankhamun is covered in marquetry that is so wonderful. It, it was a real ornament in itself. But obviously the sacred element would have been the stone that was in it, because it's always the sacred stone that's always on the coinage. But it was also said to be a communication device. Moses would communicate with God between the cherubs. Yes, but the stone itself was said to be the communication device as well. If you, if you then move on into Arthurian legend, Arthurian legend also has a sacred stone, which is known as the Holy Grail. Now, the Holy Grail has many manifestations. The Holy Grail was obviously Mary Magdalene because it's the womb of a woman. It's the Sangreal. It's the Holy Blood. But if you look into Parsifal, it becomes a stone, a sacred stone. What's more, it's a stone that you can only go near it if you have silver swords or silver knives. Why? Because it's magnetic, of course. If you went there with a, a steel, an iron sword or knife, it would get stuck on the stone, wouldn't it? And this is where we get the sword in the stone story from, from Arthurian legend. So we have this sword that was stuck in a stone. Where does this mythology of a sword being stuck in a stone come from? Well, it was the Elagabal, wasn't it? So it was highly magnetic, and a sword would get stuck on it. But King Arthur knew more than anyone else, and he could put his sword on it and take it away. Why? Because his sword was not made of steel, that's why. It wasn't iron. So if you know the tricks of magnetism, then you can bamboozle the audience, and the audience don't know what's going on. It's like that trick jug. Yeah, it's like the trick jug. I'm not sure if your listeners have uh, actually heard that one, but the trick jug for turning water into wine was a well-known trick from the first century AD. It was made by Hero of Alexandria, and he made seven, I think, different versions. So it was obviously a very popular trick. It's a high piece of technology. You have a, a standard jug with two compartments, and between the two compartments you have very, very, very small holes, only about one millimeter across. And then you have a tube round in the handle by which you can make a partial vacuum. And if you keep your finger on top of the air hole, none of the water will come out from the second compartment. But if you let your finger go, the wine will come out.
and it was his trick jug for turning water into wine. And of course, we all know who used that trick jug at the wedding at Cana. And ever since, everyone has believed this as being a miracle. But it was well known that in that era, the temples run on duping the public. Not, not a whole lot's changed. No, not a whole lot's changed. I mean, all of these, you know, relics of the saints and, and, you know, we've got a piece of the true cross and a finger of that saint or a toe of Jesus and all that sort of business, you know. It's been fakery down the years. But in the Roman era, this was real high technology fakery. So they were using magnetism. Hero of Alexandria made metal birds that sang. Now, you can imagine in the first century AD, you're going into a temple and you've got these little birds, metal birds, singing with their mouths opening and closing. You'd be quite amazed by that, wouldn't you? He made a slot machine for getting holy water. And so you put your coin into the slot machine and it delivers one jar of holy water. It's great stuff, isn't it? That's what the temples were all about. It was about entertaining the public and proving to them that this was a sacred place because things could happen here that could not happen elsewhere. Do any of these relics, the stone, the ark, travel farther west than Rome? Possibly, because we have the same traditions in Scotland as well. We have the Stone of Scone. There can be more than one stone, Ralph. There could, but they all focus back to the original stone, which was the original Benben, because it was Jacob's stone. You know, it was the stone upon which Jacob rested his head, which he basted with oil, which is what they always used to do, of course. They based these stones with oil. And the Stone of Scone is supposed to be the stone on which Jacob laid his head. So they're all focusing back onto this same central Egypto-Judaic stone, which is the Ben-Ben, which is the Stone of Jacob, which is the Stone of the Ark of the Covenant, etc. So they're all claiming that this is the same stone. I mean, we can't prove where it is or it isn't, but that is the claim. And there is a route of transmission to get this stone up to Scotland because it was in Edessa, of course. We have the information, we have the text, we have the coins. It was then in Syria under Elagabalus, and we have again, we have the coins, beautiful gold coins, actually, of the Elagabal, which are in my book. I've got several images of them. And then it was thrown out of Rome. Rome was not very impressed with this sacred stone. I don't know why. But after Elagabalus died, it was thrown out of Rome. And the question then becomes, where did it end up? Well, as a part of my previous story, where I said that Jesus was exiled to England and spent the rest of his days in an enormous great prison fortress, an enormous great um, Guantanamo Bay that they built in northwestern England in the first century. In that prison fortress, they built a temple, and it was a temple dedicated to Pisces and to the Zodiac, which is not a Roman thing to do. I mean, firstly, you don't have temples in fortresses, and secondly, the Romans were not great followers of the Zodiac or the sign of Pisces. But the people who were followers of Pisces were obviously Jesus and the disciples because they became fishers of men. And the symbol of Christianity became the symbol of the fish, of course. So they built this symbol of the fish as a temple in Chester in England in the first century AD. And at the time, it was the finest building in the whole of England. Because remember, England had only been Roman since 1843, so it had only been Roman for about 30 years when this building was first started in AD, 70, AD 72 or something like that, AD 75. So there was a lot of work put into a temple that the Romans would not normally have used, a temple dedicated to Pisces. But only 30 years later, circa AD 100 or something, the temple was destroyed. So after all of this work, the finest 
temple in the whole of England. They destroyed it. Well, how do you know it existed? Ah, because we have the evidence. They actually uncovered it. But the really strange thing is that 100, 120 years later, in 220 AD, they rebuilt it. They built a new one on top of the old one, which is really peculiar, especially as the new one wasn't the same shape as the old one. So it was still a temple of Pisces. It still had the same Piscean shape, you know, the sort of, um, what do they call it, the uh, vesica piscis shape, oblong with sharp ends. So it was built in the same shape, but it was built to different dimensions, even though it was built on top of the foundations of the old one. And we don't know why they did it, but of course it was built during the reign of Elagabalus, this strange emperor of Rome again. And I just had a faint suspicion that since his Elagabal stone was so unpopular in Rome, where would you want to put it if there was a threat that it might be destroyed? Where would you want to put it for safekeeping? Well, they put, as far as I can see, they put Jesus in Fortress Diwa in Chester for safekeeping, to keep him as far away as possible from his power base in Judea and Syria. It's the total opposite end of, of the empire. Well, the Elagabal stone, the sacred stone, that came from Syria as well. So if you wanted to keep this stone safe, or if you wanted to neuter it and, and prevent it being used and worshipped by the people of Syria, where would you put it? Again, the opposite end of the empire. And the opposite end of the empire is in Fortress Diwa in Chester. Where is the Ark now? Well, the actual wooden Ark, it would be very difficult to keep that down the centuries. It's unlikely that the wooden Ark itself would have survived, especially if it was in England with our weather conditions and everything else. But the stone, if it had come over with the stones inside it, could easily have survived. And of course, following on from this, of course, then we get the traditions of the Stone of Scone being in Scotland, which was a central part of the Scottish monarchy. It was the stone upon which the kings were crowned. Until it was moved to England, it was taken by one of the English kings very early on. And it was used as the coronation stone in England. For many centuries, every monarch in England was crowned upon the Stone of Scone, because it was housed in Westminster Abbey, of course. But as every true Scot will say, that was not the real Stone of Scone. When they came looking for the sacred stone, the Scots just said, it's that one over there, and just gave them a rough piece of sandstone, which is just a nothing piece of stone that they took away and used as the coronation stone for the English kings. And quite obviously, if they had had a sacred stone, it would have been something rather more fantastic than the stone that they gave to the English. So every true Scot will say that the stone of scone was never given to the English. It was buried, probably at Monroe's Abbey or something of that nature. And it still resides somewhere in Scotland. Have you read Graham Hancock's book, The Sign and the Seal? Yes, I have, which is a very interest, interesting book. I mean, it's, it's, it's well worth reading. He traces the Ark going down into Axum. Of course, as I said earlier, the Ethiopians claim to have it there. Well, they do, but what they refer to as the Ark is normally a reference to the stones and not the Ark itself. So when they talk about the Ark, because as Graham Hancock said himself, there are perhaps... 30 or 40 Arks of the Covenant in the British Museum. And he said, what? What? Can I see them? Can I see them? And, uh, and they said, yeah. And they took him down and showed him the Ark. But it, it wasn't the Ark as he was expecting it. It was a tablet. So it was a copy of the Tablets of Moses, of course. And they were referring to that as the Ark of the Covenant. But it was only the stones that went into the Ark. So whether... Even today, they have what we would call the Ark in Axum, or whether they just have the stones is, is another point entirely. But I don't think it went to 
Ethiopia. I think it probably went to Saba if it did go anywhere. Interesting history, and it's a shame we don't have um, more evidence for, for where these items went to. But so much has been lost to history, we don't even know where Mount Sinai is properly let alone where the uh, Ark of the Covenant is. And of course I say that we do know where Mount Sinai is. It's a very big hill sitting on the Giza Plateau. And we call it the Great Pyramid. The world of Ralph Ellis. Uh. <laughs> it makes more sense, put it that way. I mean, you know, you, you can't have a sacred hill of the Israelites that you've lost and nobody know where it, knows where it is. And you couldn't take 500,000 people across the Sinai Peninsula because they wouldn't last more than four days, let alone 40 years. Whereas a sacred hill sitting on the Giza Plateau, now that does make sense. And uh, that's where they went to. They went to uh, the Great Pyramid. One more question for you, Ralph. What is your academic background? Um, do you think you're qualified to come to the conclusions that you do? Uh, I think I'm more qualified than anyone else, actually. The problem you get with the, the two disciplines, the two primary disciplines that I'm crossing here are the religious establishment and the historical establishment. And normally, the people involved will either be brought up in one or the other. Theologians will know the biblical text, and the historians will know the historical text. But they never read each other's books. So the historians in general will never read the Bible because it's, well, it's just historical nonsense, isn't it? So they don't read that. And the theologians don't necessarily know their history very well. And so most of what I'm doing is actually comparing and combining the two. So you need to be able to span both disciplines, which I'm able to do. And I'm able to do it with a very open mind because I'm not religious. So it doesn't matter to me what a particular tribe of people were or what they did. I'm just happy to report what history says that they did. I don't have a dog in this fight. You know, it, it, to me, it doesn't matter one way or the other. So I can look at this very objectively. The others who I've been contending with, more, I think, on the historical side than the religious side, seem to be bitterly opposed to this. And they don't know... They don't know their own history as well as they should do, and they certainly don't know the biblical texts as well as they should do. And so they rather get trapped in, in the discussions we've had. So they've made various complaints about this is wrong and that's wrong. And then I prove to them that this is right, actually. Look, here's the evidence, here's the quotes. And then they start to get a bit hot under the collar, and then they delete me from the blog and delete all the comments. So what we're having at present is academia living under censorship, really. If people go on to the various blogs on, on the web, they will see various comments. But if they see these various comments, note that all the replies have been deleted. Why have they been deleted? Well, because they lost the argument. And all they can do is delete the blogs and hide behind censorship. So I'm banned now from five historical blogs because I'm not allowed to comment there anymore because uh, they've effectively lost the argument. Which is sad, really, that it's, it's gone down that road. You say you don't have a dog in the fight. You've written many books. Do any of the books contradict any of the other books, or do they all work together? Have you disproven yourself? No, surprisingly. Well, I've attempted to disprove myself, as it were, by continuing writing and writing and writing. But surprisingly, the books all back each other up, which is not because I was working in that direction, it's just, just what happened. And that, that can really only happen if you're working on a, a vein of historical truth. So, for instance, in Jesus' Last of the Pharaohs and King Jesus, I was concentrating on Jesus being Jesus of Gamala. And then later on, it transpired that Another possibility was that actually this Jesus guy could have been King Jesus. So you might say there's a difference, but when I looked at it in the round, it was quite obvious that Jesus of Gamala and King Jesus were the same person. So the one story was backing up the other because they're two sides of the same coin. They're talking about the same events. 
And you can see that in the books of Josephus, where all the same things happen to both people. The books themselves have become internally cross-checking themselves. So they, they support each other, even though there's like 15 years difference between the first one and the last one. There is no contradiction within the books, which is quite amazing. They continually back each other up with further discoveries that I had no idea about when I first started this, you know, 15 years ago. I knew nothing about King of Edessa. In fact, I didn't know anything about the King of Edessa until about two years ago. I don't think anyone else does, actually. I've spoken to many people about Edessa, and nobody knows who on earth Edessa is, because it's been effectively covered up. But having discovered this monarchy and looked into their history, both via the Western historians and also by the Eastern historians, which is very important, looking into the um, Armenian records, that the evidence you get then backs up what you've said 15 years ago about Jesus in Judea, even though you didn't even know who this guy was 15 years ago. I think it's quite a convincing argument that this is all a very strong vein of real history. Otherwise, it would not work like that. You can't keep plucking things out of history that fit the same story. And yet it does time and time again. It fits the story every time. Academia doesn't like it at all. And I'm not sure why. I've got believers against it. I've got atheists against it. And they just seem to be against it for no particular good reason, just for the sake of being against it. No, that's impossible. Why is it impossible? It's just impossible. There is no, it's just. Tell me why it's impossible. Oh, well, I'm not debating with you. And you think, oh, hold on a minute. You know, th this is not academic debate. You know, if you, if you want to debate a subject, you know, debate it with me. But don't dismiss something when you've not even read the book or anything about it. I had one reviewer dismissed my book because... I was totally wrong about King Agbar the Sixth of Edessa and totally wrong about King Manu the Tenth, which is a bit strange since I never mentioned those two monarchs at all. <laughs> so he's plucked something out of the air that I don't mention whatsoever in any of my books. All very interesting. <laughs> to the audience, check out www.edfu-books.com. And pick up a copy of Atlantis Rising. You're on the front page there, one of the featured articles, The Garden of Eden in Egypt. Yes. Startling evidence for a game-changing hypothesis. So there's even lots of new stuff out there from you. Ralph Bellis, thank you once again for being on the program. Very good talking to you again. It's always, always a pleasure.